Welcome back to the Blue Chip Breakdown, Vols fans. I'm your host, Bull. Good Thursday to everybody. Sweet 16 starts tonight, and Tennessee doesn't play until tomorrow. But if you got a bracket, then you're going to be watching these next couple of days very closely because our brackets are pretty much shaping up uh, down the home stretch. So we'll know who's going to be the winners pretty much after this weekend, at least for mine. And I can tell you right now that I'm sitting at number three. If UConn and if NC State loses and Tennessee wins, I pretty much win my bracket. So there's a lot to be excited about right there. And we've also got a really big announcement coming up tonight with Ethan Utley. We talked about him yesterday. He is the four-star defensive lineman from Ainsworth in Nashville, Tennessee. He's a really big prospect that I feel like Tennessee needs to close out on because that is a extreme position of need for us moving forward. We know that our D-line is stacked at this point, but most of those guys are seniors and they're going to be gone after this year. So we're going to need to get in some good young talent. And if we could close out on Ethan Utley, then that will be a great start to this class. Now we are in a battle uh, between Texas and Michigan. And I, you know, I think that they're very, very close, especially Texas with Tennessee, but I do feel like we have the edge in that. And we will be going live for that tonight if we can find that stream. So if you are subscribed to this channel, keep a close eye out because I will be posting here shortly if I can find it or not and if we will be going live. But it should be a really good day for our volunteers. And what the heck is going on with Joe Milton's comments after his pro day yesterday? All of all nations talking about this. And I'm going to play that clip with context and I'll tell you what I think if he is indeed throwing Tennessee under the bus. And finally, we also had a lot of media members from outside of Tennessee's program on campus yesterday to observe our scrimmage and also our pro day. What were their thoughts? We'll get into some of that as well. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit about who performed well in our pro day. But before we get into it, please do us a really big favor. Make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. All right, so first and foremost, we got to talk about Joe Milton's comments after his pro day, and we'll talk about how he performed after this because I think he had a really, really great day. But let's go ahead and get into this clip, okay? I'm going to let y'all listen to it, and, you know, y'all come up with y'all's own conclusions, and let me know down in the comments section, and then I'm going to give you mine. Joe, that was a really long throwing session. Was it important to show that you could you could make all the throws in that um, way? Absolutely, but um, I feel like my main goal is, you know, just be on the center more. Um, also, just touch balls um, from different platforms and from regular drops as well. From the center. How comfortable are you under center like that? Oh, uh, fine. I actually mm -hmm. like playing slow, to be honest. Uh, I know we play a fast pace here, but uh, Coach Hyper don't be mad at me. So. <laughs> I like playing slow. Uh, I just feel like you get to see everything. Um, and the person, the quarterback I am, I'm big on details. So uh, you get to see everything that you want to see and make it happen. All right, so Joe Milton has asked how close what he is under the center. And the reason for that is in the NFL offenses, 85% of what they do is under the center. They will get a shotgun sometimes and they will go up tempo sometimes, but that's in two minute drill and things like that. It's not on an all the time basis. So keep in mind that Joe Milton is interviewing at all times, especially whenever he's talking to the media. He's got to do a really good job of speaking to the prospective teams that he feels like will be drafting him at some point coming up in, you know, like a month or so. So I feel like he did a really good job of conveying the fact that, hey, you know, Tennessee's offense prepared me for the NFL because we go so fast and you have less time to process. And in the NFL, he's basically saying it's going to be a lot easier because I'm going to have a lot more time to process. And if you like what I did out here, uh, just in running around, throwing the ball and all that type of stuff, then just imagine what I can do from a production standpoint if the offenses are slowed down. All he's doing is trying to get drafted. And I really do not feel like he said anything negative about Tennessee. Some people are taking it that way, but at the same time, we've got so many people that just love bashing Joe Milton for whatever reason and bashing some of our other players too. And I've said this so many times on this channel, I sound like a broken record, but we got to stop doing that. Like we've got to stop trying to find reasons to hate Joe. I mean, he was a great teammate for us. He was a great player. Okay. Uh, you know, I would say more off the field than on the field. I'm not going to sit here and say that he's, you know, some hall of fame guy will probably, you know, his Jersey is not going to be lifted up anywhere for us, but just what he meant, I think uh, for this team in a transitional year, right. Him being that, back up to Hinton Hooker in a season that we very well could have been a playoff team. We really should have been. And if Hinton Hooker didn't go down, then we probably would have been. Um, and then, you know, having this transitional season in 2023 where we didn't really have a whole lot of talent, especially on the outside, okay? Like, Brew goes down. This team this past season really wasn't as ready as I feel like, you know, at least on this channel, we kind of thought we were. And a lot of that could be kind of blamed on Joe Milton. Maybe it's because 
the fast paced offense just didn't fit his skill set as well. And that's why he didn't perform as well. But at the end of the day, he was a really big mentor in uh, Nico's redshirt year, right? Uh, which is very similar to what Patrick Mahomes had to do. He comes into the NFL, doesn't play his first season. Okay, he sits behind Alex Smith. But then once he you know, gets that opportunity to be the starter, we saw how special he was from day one. We're seeing the same things with Nico. And, you know, I feel like Joe Milton just did a really good job of teaching him how to be almost like a professional quarterback at this level. So you have to be very thankful to what Joe Milton did for this university. And let's stop bashing him. But I want to go ahead and get into how he performed out there on the field yesterday, where I think his draft stock is at currently. And I'll touch on a few other players as well. So on to Joe Milton's performance on the field at his pro day. Number one, something that he talked about himself was he wanted to showcase that he can get up under that center and look more crisp in his drops. He didn't look great doing that uh, at the NFL combine, but I think he looked a lot better at his pro day. His throws were spot on. I mean, they were on the money. Just, I mean, great touch, great timing. I heard from some of the insiders that, man, he threw over like 100-something balls and only five of them hit the ground. So that's a huge deal, especially kind of, you know, rolling out to your right, rolling out to your left. And uh, just being, you know, again, on the money, on target, on time, and throwing the ball with that touch. You know, he looked really good doing that. And then he also, at the end, was able to showcase that cannon that he has. And, I mean, I'm telling you, coaches are going to love that. Scouts are going to love that. Because if you can throw the ball 80-something yards, then, hey, we can teach you how to throw the ball 5 to 10, uh, you know, 15 to 20 yards for sure. So that's going to help him out tremendously. Now, the biggest thing for me is him coming in at six foot five, almost 250 pounds, running a four five forty. And I was watching that yesterday as P and I were doing our video, and it didn't look that fast. But at the same time, literally, I'm you know trying to listen to P and I'm trying to time it in my head. So it didn't look as fast as it ended up being, and that's huge news for Joe Milton. We told y'all if he runs up under a four six, watch out for him to move up to that third round, and that's where I'm projecting Joe Milton to be at at this point. We'll see what happens. I haven't. Uh, you know, heard any or seen any new updates from any insiders as far as where he's going to be getting drafted at. Like, no new mock drafts have come out just yet, but I'm going to be looking out for that. I, I think we all should. I think that he definitely is going to be probably bare minimum fourth round pick on everyone's mock draft. And if they have him up under that, I mean, it's really a joke. I can also tell you this, uh, just from watching every other quarterback that's gone so far in their pro days and at the NFL Combines, Joe Milton by far was the most impressive. And I don't think that it's really even that close. Uh, Caleb Williams didn't look great at his pro day by any means. You know, he made some throws that were spot on, but the ball was wobbly and all that type of stuff. So, you know, that doesn't mean everything, but he just was not that impressive. He's not as big as Joe Milton. He definitely ain't as fast. He's not as good of an athlete. Um, don't even get me started on a guy like JJ McCarthy. I mean, I think it's a joke that they're literally just trying to force feed him into the first round. He's nowhere near that, okay? He just isn't by any means. And I'll be interested to see, do the NFL scouts, coaches, and GMs just kind of go with what these analysts are saying, or do they evaluate him on their own? Because, man, I mean, there's no reason that he should be ranked higher than Joe Milton as an NFL prospect. He's just like nowhere near that. They talk about, oh, you know, he's got a really good arm and, uh, you know, he's a mobile player. He's fast. But Joe Milton is better at all of those things than J.J. is. And I also think that Joe Milton isn't as much of a head case as J.J. is. So that would be the biggest reason that I wouldn't want to draft him if I was uh, an NFL uh, scout or coach or GM. Like, I don't want anyone that is going to fold up under pressure. And I think that J.J. McCarthy definitely would on the NFL level uh, going up against better athletes if we have to put the ball in his hands because you cannot rely on on your running backs the entire season, especially not in those key situations in the NFL. So anyway, my rant with that is over with, but I'm just, I'm sick of hearing it because it's hurting our players that they're trying to boost up these other guys that are really not even deserving of the praise that they're getting. But we're going to go on to the next few players. And let's start off with Kamal Haddon. I think he had a pretty good showing. He looked good out there in his field drills, but you know his 40 time wasn't what he would have liked. A 4-5-3 is what I'm hearing that he ran. You would definitely want to be in the 4-4s. Now, the thing about him is that he's going to be a bigger corner. He's about six foot two, 200 pounds, so that's going to help him out. And also, if you look at his game film, I mean, he played great, especially last season. He was a shutdown, uh, you know, lockdown corner for sure. And I think that he's a guy that can play inside or outside and follow wide receivers anywhere. So 
you know, I would say that if you look at, uh, you know, the way that he interviews, the way that he speaks, things like that, you can tell that he's got that confidence. And we also kind of saw that in his play. He would, you know, maybe come off of a bad play, but he would make a really good one after that. And he also rides the wave of some good plays as well. So being able to string together several, uh, you know, really big time plays is huge. And being able to bounce back from a bad play is critical playing at the cornerback position. I think that he shouldn't get drafted. I would say any lower than the fifth round. I would say anywhere from maybe late third to fifth round is about where he should end up at. But it, you know, with both of those players and with all these players, it's really going to, at the end of the day, come down to how do they interview with each individual team and does that institution or, you know, does that, um, does that team feel like there's a good fit between that player and their organization? So on to the next player that I want to talk about, and that is Jabari Small. He ran a 4.55, which isn't bad for a running back, but he is a smaller one. I don't know what he weighed in at, what his measurables were. I think he's somewhere around five foot nine, maybe 215 pounds, which isn't that big. Um, you know, I think everything that he did, you know, as far as the measurables and stuff is just very, very average. But he looks really good going through all of his drills. He's got really quick feet. And you can kind of see the difference in how fast his feet are compared to Jalen Wright. But Jalen Wright is projected to be a higher draft pick. So it's not just about one individual thing. It's about the entire body of work. I think that um, Mr. Small was very productive as a Tennessee running back. I think he averaged about five yards per carry last year in the SEC. That should be pretty big. Um, and, you know, I, I could go to a guy like Corum. If he's going to get drafted, then I feel like Jabari Small should most definitely get drafted, too. They're pretty much a very similar players. But I think that uh, Mr. Small is faster than Blake Corum is. So, again, man, not to pick on Michigan, but I just think that they hype these guys up for Michigan too much here lately. And I'm not quite sure why, but we've got guys that can ball, too. Now, I think that Jabari Small, it's going to be tough for him to get drafted. I would say an undrafted free agent. And, you know, I would say with him and with Haddon, after they get drafted and they play for like a year or two, everyone's going to look back and say, hey, how did this player fall this low in the draft? Because they're all really good players. And, you know, I'm expecting for them to go into a training camp and show out. And, you know, we heard that last year with pretty much all of our players out. They were showing out. And, you know, I'm expecting to hear the same thing this year. But on to the next player, and that's going to be Cali Castles. He came in a shade up under 6'5", and I think at about 245 pounds which is prototype tight end size in the NFL. And I don't know what his 40 time was. We heard it was somewhere in that 4-6 range. Was it a low 4-6? Was it a high 4-6? That does make a pretty big difference, especially for a player that doesn't have a whole lot of draft buzz. They didn't get to go to that NFL combine. Um, but I think that he looked great just going through pretty much everything, okay? If you want a tight end that can block, that can run routes, um, and, you know, be a guy that you get a whole lot of bang for your buck with, just like we talked about with these other guys, it would most definitely be Cali Castles. Uh, you know, I'll be interested to see how he does at his interviews with these individual teams, but I think that he's going to blow it out of the water just like all the rest of our players. Um, and we can also talk about Jacob Warren. Didn't get to see him do much, but he's a taller guy, and I think that he's going to interview well uh, just like everyone else. So he's one that maybe he could end up getting picked up as an undrafted free agent. I would say that Cali Castles, I didn't talk about him yet uh, getting drafted, but I would say he could end up being like a later round pick. I mean, I would say anywhere from the fifth to maybe seventh round. Someone's going to probably end up picking him up. I think he just, he just has too much upside. Um, but again, Jacob Warren, I would say probably going to be an undrafted free agent. Um, and then outside of that, I don't know if we have too many more players that necessarily have a realistic shot to get drafted. Maybe get picked up, okay? Uh, we could talk about Ramel Keaton, who ran a 4-4-1. That's going to look good at six foot three. Somebody's going to bring him in for a personal workout and see, hey, you know, can he help us out? Can he be a practice squad guy for us? Maybe everyone that's left could end up being practice squad guys. Uh, we don't know how the offensive lineman did. We got to see Ollie Lane snapping the football. I guess he looked good doing that. You know, I don't know about a guy like D. Williams. Does he have a realistic shot at getting picked up, especially with the new, uh, you know, kickoff changes and things like that? You know, we still have Punt and all of that. Maybe he could work himself, uh, you know, into getting picked up somewhere for those purposes, because he is a really good punt return man. And, you know, I think that he could have a good NFL career just doing that. And, you know, not to mention, he can go out for routes. He has really good hands and he can play in the secondary. So he could really bring a whole lot of value to an organization. But I would say for him, probably undrafted free agent. Um, and we already know about Jalen Wright, but that's pretty much it as far as the players that 
I see having a realistic shot at getting picked up somewhere. Now, let's go ahead and switch gears to what the media had to say that was present for our scrimmage yesterday. And the biggest takeaway has been that, man, that team is deep everywhere, especially at the wide receiver position. We heard uh, several analysts talking about, man, those wide receivers are big, strong, fast, and physical, and they made some really good catches. We're hearing high praises about Nico Iamaleava and the way that he's operating that offense, the way that his throws and passes look. A lot of folks are saying, hey, this could be a replica of 2022, but we already knew that, right? Like, we pretty much knew coming into the season that this team was going to be ready. It was going to be a team that could be, uh, you know, a playoff team for sure. And we heard uh, Andy Staples say that he predicts Tennessee to go at about 10-2. and two. I think that's a really safe pick, right? These guys are not just going to be blowing smoke and saying stuff to necessarily have hot takes, especially Andy Staples. He's usually pretty conservative with his takes. So if he's saying 10-2 and two for Tennessee at this point in the game, then y'all have to know we've got a really good shot to run the tables. Like P and I have been telling y'all, the entire offseason, this team looks really good, especially on both fronts. And that's where football is won and lost. At. That's where it starts, and that's where it ends. That defensive line, everyone's saying, man, is one of the deepest in the entire country, if not the deepest. And with the offensive line, we're hearing, man, they're deep as well. Outside of the backup center, I've heard that there's some issues there. So not quite sure what's going on with a guy like Vice and Lane. We know that William Satterwhite is a true freshman, and we're not really expecting for him to contribute to the team much this season. But he may end up having to if Vice and Lang isn't getting it picked up. Now, we know that push comes to shove. We can put Dane Davis at that position. But, you know, is that going to take away from my left guard spot? Because that's where I think that Dane Davis is going to end up starting at. And, you know, we've also heard, you know, outside of the media presence, we have heard that uh, Tennessee may end up trying to go to that portal to get a few players. And I think that running back and center could end up being two of the positions that Tennessee will target. We'll see how everything kind of plays out towards the end of the offseason, but you've got to feel very good about where our volunteers are at right now. And, I, you know, I just want to touch on that just to let y'all know, hey, we're not the only ones that see how special and how talented this team is this year. But again, it's going to be about staying healthy. It's going to be about everyone playing together as a team, and it all has to come together. They've got to prove it. But I love what I heard about our scrimmage yesterday, just in how competitive everyone was. And uh, something else that we heard is that James Pierce has been getting the better of Lance Hurd. So iron sharpens iron, right? But we already know that Lance Hurd is going to be a really good offensive tackle. To hear that James Pierce is continuing to be dominant, I mean, we should feel really, really good. You know, I think we will end up having the best pass rush in the entire country. We definitely have the best pass rusher in the entire country. We've got a lot of other guys that can do it at a really high level. And I think that just the offensive line is going to get so much deeper having to go up against these guys on a consistent basis. Uh, I'm not going to talk y'all's ear off about all that, though, because a lot of the stuff y'all have already heard. And I just kind of wanted to touch on it because I'm so proud of our volunteers. And I love this team, man. You know, I, I love what we're doing here. Uh, just with the you know draft coming up, I think that we're going to shock some people. And also, uh, you know, just in the way that we are performing out there on the field and in pretty much all facets of our program. But that's going to be it for this video. Please, as always, make sure to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, share with your friends, family, and other volunteer fans. And we'll see you all in the next one. Thanks. Peace.